Hey everybody, welcome to lecture nine um, in our study of hermeneutics. Applying the rules of hermeneutics is um, really where we're at right now. Making that transition, I showed you how to study on phrases, on words, English words, also studying, utilizing the Greek equivalents. Of course, you can do the same thing with the Hebrew. Remember my approach to hermeneutics of what I'm teaching you right now. The 10 rules of hermeneutics that I've given you is, um, I, I think, pretty much common. And then, of course, the exegesis that we're now moving into, of, uh, of basically gathering our information, drawing out the interpretation, is an approach for everyday Bible study. There may be different, uh, there are different approaches to exegesis. Mine is really going to be very simple, very, very focused on just uh, collecting all of the information and following three very important uh, 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 rules of hermeneutics above all others. Um, and well, you know, my first rule of hermeneutics is to be led by the Holy Ghost. And, and there's simply, you know, no underplaying that. But I'm always asking this very objective three rules. Number one rule, it, do I have two or three witnesses on any particular um, subject that I'm studying or conclusion that I'm deriving because you're going to start deriving conclusions and that's where we're going to be getting to by by lecture uh, by the next lecture lecture 10 and so when you're looking at conclusions you're summarizing you're making conclusions you want to always be asking these questions do I have two or three verses of scripture so all of you that are taking this class you're going to be responsible to have your conclusions basically written by next week okay so that lecture 10 and so when you're going through this make sure that you're asking yourself and you're also identifying when you do these conclusions yes here i have two or three scriptures they're in context which is number two number three they are not presenting any known contradiction <clears throat> now i say known because you got to become more skilled in the bible um, as time goes on to recognize whether or not you really maybe have created a contradiction and didn't know it, okay? So, but within the framework of your study right now, you wanna make sure that you're not doing that. You're not creating any kind of known contradictions. Once again, three important rules. Do I have two or three verses of scripture? Is it, are they all three in context? Am I creating any contradictions? So, you know, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at the word baptism. We're going to look at the categories of baptism. Um, I, I probably will show you, you know, um, a couple of ways to do this. We'll do it with the English word, and then we'll also do it with the Greek word. And then we're going to study a phrase. And that phrase is, that other important phrase is, to believe in the name of Jesus, you're saved, or in the or, or to be saved in the name of Jesus, to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus, and also the concept of being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And do, do we present any contradictions here in scripture? Um, you know, what really are we saying uh, when we utilize those phrases? How important are those phrases uh, to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and or to be baptized in the name of Jesus? And what is the bigger subject matter as well? What, are, what is the theme of the scripture and what really saves us? How are we saved? And, um, you know, when you start studying <laughs> like Acts 8, 15 through 17, somebody said, well, this takes a lot of work to study just one verse of scripture. Well, you know what? You can either study it or you can sit around and you can be a, imaginative. And, you know, based upon your ideas, your collected information over the years, you can start, you know, assuming things well let's not do that it's just wrong we're gonna we're gonna be steered wrong so let's start off with baptism here and i think that really what i want to do is, is to rather than um to um just take it in order to begin with i want to take something that is a little bit challenging okay and just show you something with this okay that's very very important and so you can, I think probably the best way to do this to start off with is just type in the English word into your search engine. By the way, I use Logos. If you really, there's a freeware in Logos. If you really want to get um, a lot of information quickly, 
you can get scholars library logos and that you know I think that there's a, a vast number of scholars out there uh, that are utilizing logos and for good cause so uh, go ahead and just type in ba baptize like B A B T I Z Ascaris and then that's going to take in baptism baptized um, baptizing all of those um, very uh, unique um, you could say uh, suffixes but um, and then of course if you type if you go ahead and you search by uh, the Greek word hi Ann search by the Greek word um, <laughs> then uh, it, it's going to collect every word on uh, and the Greek word would be baptismo uh, uh, baptismo or baptizo okay and just to throw that out there just to help edify you and your pursuit of Greek so let's look at John 3 22 just to start off with as we go collecting the information on baptism and giving you a clue a head start because obviously you want to be able to benefit from the other information that people have and um, one of the important things to me is also as I said to be able to consult commentaries in the end which is also going to give you some additional information and things that you didn't think of and we're going to always have a guarded optimism with commentaries recognize that sometimes that those commentaries can be biased and we're trying to unbiased ourselves uh, but nonetheless you know we're going to be considering everything that everyone has to say and especially when they're saying it and they're applying the rules of hermeneutics and you know it really has a harmony with the rest of scripture rather than to being you know something that belongs to as I said uh, a particular uh, bias so John 3 22 says that after these saints came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea and and there he tarried with them and baptized Jesus baptized hmm what was he baptized how was he baptizing okay because we're now we're going to go and collect this information on John baptizing and somebody says to me hey how important is it to understand how that the Aseans baptized or other examples of baptism that is um, you know extra biblical or extra New Testament okay it's outside of the New Testament you know it, there's nothing wrong with looking at those things there's no harm in it but it, it you know it that has to be done with caution okay because we don't want to superimpose things on the scripture I'm saying that the Word of God is complete in itself and that the Word of God is going to speak for itself and the Word of God is going to interpret itself so one of our rules of hermeneutics that is also extremely important that I put way up there is let the Bible interpret the Bible okay let the Bible speak for itself uh, and so if we're going to let the Bible interpret the Bible, yeah, we can talk about how the Essenes baptized, but we're not going to bias the, what the scripture is saying based upon how this, what the Essenes did as though, you know, baptism was, you know, derived from some um, tradition that they had. Now, this is, this is revelation from God, and we're going to keep it that way. So we know how John baptized. He baptized people unto repentance for so that baptism was a baptism of repentance for sin well is that what Jesus is doing and then you know you just go on and you read and John also baptized in a non near to uh, Salim because there was much water there and they came and were baptized for John was not yet cast into prison then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying and they came into John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that is with thee beyond Jordan, to whom you bore witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given with given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I have sent to uh, before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, and the friend of the bridegroom, which stand, stands by and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that he came from above, and he is above all. 
he, he is uh, he that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what uh, he has seen and heard that he testifies and no man receives his testimony. He that receiveth the testimony have not has set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God for God giveth him the spirit uh, does not give him the spirit by measure. Okay, so um, wow, there's a lot of information there. And, um, you know, we find out that Jesus himself didn't baptize, but his disciples. Okay. So somebody says, starts asking questions of the text. Okay. There are certain questions that simply cannot be answered. Somebody said, how did Jesus baptize or rather, how did his disciples baptize? And wow, look at this additional information. Number one there's just this pericope, okay? This is it. It is not talked about, I don't believe, I'm pretty certain I'm saying this pretty confidently without having pre-checked again, but I'm pretty sure you will not find this in any other gospel and there will not be any other mention of it in the rest of the New Testament. Is it true? It's true. What do we know about it? Limited information. What kind of questions can we ask? Well, we can ask any question we want, but if we said, what was it? What was a baptism formula? What was he, how was he actually baptizing them? Then you stop there because there's no information given and we don't argue from silence and we don't sit around and guess, oh, well, he must've been baptizing just like John was baptizing because after all, could he be using the baptism formula, for example, that Philip used? Or was he baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost when he was baptizing? Or was he just doing it just like John was doing it? And you can look at baptism formula of John and you can begin to ask all these questions and it's fine to ask a question, but here's my important point that I want to make to you. The Bible has to answer those questions. You can't go to extra biblical information and answer those questions. You can't guess what those questions, the answer to those questions are. You cannot argue from silence. If there's nothing said, we just leave it. We can simply say, hey, baptism is important. Jesus did it. Or rather, at least Jesus disciples did it under his leadership, okay? And then you just leave it there. How many things in the Bible do we have to do that with? Many, because we only, sometimes we only have one verse of scripture or we have only a, you know, paracope where, in other words, it's a, it's a theme or a topic or uh, uh, like we're discussing now, Jesus baptizing, but... And so there's three, four verses of scripture there that are supporting that, but there's not any additional information. And then especially, let me just back up to only having one verse of scripture. What do you do? Here's what you do. You recognize it's true. <laughs> What's said is true, but we have to just leave it as a piece of information that it's not going to give us a lot of explanation or additional information and we can't we've got to be careful about what we say about it and one of the things that when you only have one verse of scripture one of the things you got to be challenged to do is that you got to look at you got to look at translating it and see how many different ways you could translate it and one of the things that I enjoy doing uh, from a linguistics point of view is I like to take a a particular word and I like to see how many different ways that word can be defined, how many different ways then, you know, you can understand the usage of that word in a, in a sentence. And once again, as I said before, we're not relying upon, you know, just relying upon lexicons and dictionaries, you know, to give us definitions of words. We want to look at how that word is used elsewhere in scripture and then let that then guide us in context because you have a denotation of a word, a definition of word, or a connotation of a word. And if you can just give yourself to searching out words and we've got all these great search engines that do this and we've got great dictionaries that do it well like Theological Workbook of the Old Testament or the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Both of those are great series. Um, you know, there was a lot in the past. Everybody would talk about 
the etymology of a word. What is the root word? And then they would chase down, you know, all the various different derivations of that root. You got to be very careful with that. I think by and large, that isn't really the approach anymore, that there may be some value that you can get out of that. You've got to be very guarded on that. <laughs> and I can give you some radical examples, you know, <laughs> um, but at any rate, I'm, I'm not going to go into that right now because I'm going to get off on some uh, other topics, but I'm going to tell you root words can lead you down a wrong path if you're trying to look at an etymology study of where of the origin of a word or wor how words are derived from its roots. It's best to look at a word in context. How was it used and apply it that way? So, um, I hope you appreciate this example. There are many more of them. I hope you learn how to just, when you don't have a lot of information on a particular subject, you just let it rest. It's not to say that it's only one verse of scripture on it and it's not true. It's, it's one verse of scripture and it's true. It's just that you've got to be careful what you say about that. And certainly before you venture off to say something about a, a, a topic that only has one verse of scripture associated with this topic concept idea that you got to be able to certainly translate it. Make sure you understand how many different ways it can be translated. Understand all the different possible meanings that we could derive from this particular verse of scripture. Then ask yourself the question, is there any other, you know, closely associated uh, verses of scripture with this subject or topic? And... Be careful with it. The Bible is a book about redemption. The primary subjects that people really need to grasp and get a hold of, I don't think we've done that. <laughs> and it has copious amounts of information available for us. So there's no reason for us to go write our own Bible. <laughs> there's no reason for us to fill in the blanks. It just take the word of God for what it is. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna put in my search engine, I'm going to put in baptizo and um, and I'm going to see how many times that word comes up and then I'm going to do, uh, you know, because I just want to kind of get a feel for, you know, just that particular Greek word and, and how many potentially different words I have on baptism or baptized. You want to understand that? Very important. You'll discover that there are like the word flesh. I mean, my goodness, you have sarks, you have soma. Sometimes soma and sarks can actually be used synonymously. You know, sarks mean flesh, you know, flesh in, 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 in the sense of, um, uh, uh, of, of nature and in the sense of human ability. And then soma being body. And, you know, just, you want to just get at understanding if there are a number of different Greek words that are associated with your singular English word or vice versa. Um, if there are a number, not, not only can a Greek word be translated in many different ways, but an English word have potentially several other Greek words, and you want to be able to run those down. And it's not that difficult to do it. You just got to apply yourself to it. I don't know that I'm going to have an opportunity to really show you how to do that and to walk you through that. Um, I might actually, uh, towards the end, do something like that. But... Let's just start, and once again, what we're going to do is we're going to be collecting our information here on the different categories of baptism. And there are three different categories of baptism, as I've already said, um, especially last lecture, and I think I actually said it also before, and that is you're baptized in water, you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, and you're baptized in the body of Christ, okay? And so we want to be able to, to, to break those out. There's the baptism... Of, of John to write, start right off with, and then there's the baptism of the, uh, that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ then gave, and then the baptism uh, then that um, we are to follow, and all of God's servants are to participate with this wonderful, what we would refer to as a sacrament, okay, this act of obedience, okay, um, those that believe in are baptized shall be saved. That's a pretty radical statement, isn't it? I think, uh, let me just say this to you. I have, you know, because I do a lot of um, ministry around the world, Asia, Middle East, and I found that <laughs> a lot of people come to the altar, but when they come to the water, things get different. 
And I've had people that were willing to come to, to the altar and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, but they were not willing to be baptized in water. And there's a couple of different religions, especially that I have seen this over and again, Hinduism being one of them, which has a baptism formula within it, um, uh, Judaism being another, but you know, I'm not going to go into all of those right now. We've got left enough information. I just want to say to this, I want to say this to all of you. I hope that everybody after this series, if you've not had a, put a, a, a preeminence on baptism and baptism being a part of seeing people brought into the kingdom of God, that from this day forward, you will. And it's not my bias. It's just, let's just look here. Okay, you'll see yourself. So we start off with Matthew 3, 6 and uh, and. It talks about how that people were going to be baptized by John in the Jordan, Jordan, and what were they doing? They were going there and they were confessing their sins, and there was this this washing or this cleansing that was represented by water baptism, and it was a this anointing that God had given to John. So it's good to run that down, understand a little bit more about this baptism unto repentance, this baptism. Uh, where they would ultimately come confess their sins, they would be baptized, and that there was a grace at work there for them. And it was in the bigger topic of John preparing the way of the Lord for Jesus, okay? It was his Holy Ghost conviction power that God gave to John the Baptist that caused people from all around not to come because of signs and wonders and miracles, very unique, but become, to come because specifically of this amazing Holy Ghost conviction that was going on that would draw them to a place to be able to be cleansed from their sins. Powerful, huh? Uh, unique idea to grab a hold of. Understand, what, where is this going? You know, what, what does this mean? This has importance. What does it mean? Okay, and let's let's... Let's run those things down. It's important. Um, okay, so Matthew 3, 7, but when he, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, John's baptism, he said unto them, O generations of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Okay, once again, that was the, I, I went ahead to give that verse of scripture because it emphasizes the Holy Ghost conviction that was there that brought the fear of the Lord to people. And then here's John's annou announcement. So here's a new category, okay? I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Grab hold of that. Okay, they were confessing their sins. It was a baptism unto repentance. We know that there was Holy Ghost conviction in it because people were, you know, fleeing from the wrath of God. A fear of God was there. Uh, associated with it. And now here's a new category, and it's the baptism now that John is describing that is going to be performed by Jesus, okay? He says, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but the one who's coming after me, whose shoes I'm not worthy uh, to bear, to carry, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It's very important that you recognize clearly that we're not talking about the element of water anymore. So this has nothing to do with what was said in John chapter 3, 22. Obviously, you can search that out. But this clearly has to do with the ministry of Jesus. After that, he ascended up on high. And is more under, a little bit more understood with respect, to, for example, to John chapter 7, 37 through 39, um, and which is referring to... Uh, the, the, the fact that the baptism of that the Holy Ghost had not yet been given, but uh, after that he was glorified, then this uh, this act or grace of God was supplied. So, okay, understand, very, very important. There is a baptismal ministry of Jesus going on for the believer, okay? We're going to see that, and you meet, make that category. There's a baptismal ministry going on uh, for the believer, that is a baptism into the Holy Ghost. Very important. There's a baptism going on that is a baptism for the believer that is done by the preacher, the minister, okay? Like Philip, for example, and the eunuch, or Philip and the Samaritans, okay? And then there is a baptism that is a baptism into water, Okay, then we discover 
that there's also a baptism that is performed by the Holy Spirit. And we find that in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll see this later. And that baptism is to baptize us into the body of Christ. So those categories are very, very important to sort out, to understand the, so, so, uh, you know, the similarities and the difference. And, you know, one of the ways you can just simply begin to think about it is Christ is the baptizer who baptizes the believer into the element, the Holy Ghost. You know, the minister is the, is, is the baptizer who baptizes the believer into the element, the water. The Holy Spirit is the baptizer, and he baptizes the believer into the element, the body of Christ. Okay? Understand, those three categories are really solid. They're very solid. So start collecting information on those, and, or, or rather, just start collecting information. Beware of sensitive to those categories. As you categorize however you want to, it just, in the end, you want to be able to get at summaries quicker or sooner than later, and especially those of you who are taking this class who <laughs> are going to be getting, you know, a grade on this. Okay, so we've got a lot of information right here in Matthew 3, 6 through 16, just on this baptism. Okay, so we look at verse 13. Uh, Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan and was baptized of, Jesus, uh, baptized of John. Wow. I mean, come on, people. That can't be just overlooked. What on earth was Jesus doing? Somebody says, well, we need to be baptized to wash away sins. No, you don't. No, you don't. First of all, the blood of Jesus is what cleanses from sin. And number, and then secondly, or especially with this particular uh, category, look at this. Here we've got Jesus being baptized by John, which was a baptism where people came confessing their sins and repenting and having amends for those sins to be cleansed, okay? And you can check on that cleansing. Was there a cleansing there? Okay, that's a question for you. Okay, was there a cleansing there? Well, Jesus had no sins to confess. <laughs> Why was he coming and getting baptized by John? Important, important. It's got to be a part of the whole picture. It's not just something that is said, oh, by the way, every word of God is perfect. And, I, you know, I found that, that, you know, that things that seem to be very vague and, you know, just a little information on, uh, on it in, in in the Bible, many times the purpose of it is to set a boundary. You can't go past this limit. It sets a boundary, a plan, it defines a a a belief field rather than a playing field. Okay, so now said. So Jesus answered, said unto them, Suffer it to be so, because I want to fulfill all righteousness. I mean, because John's saying, What are you talking about? Are you coming to me to be baptized? I need to be baptized of you. So John's already recognizing that there is a baptism that Jesus is going to give Jesus is saying, I'm going to fulfill all of righteousness. What's going on there? Okay. It's easy to flesh out what's going on there. I'm going to leave that to you. Okay. And Jesus, when he was baptized, came up out of the water and behold, the heavens were opened and they saw this. And, and he, and he, John saw the spirit of God, which once again is a synonym for the Holy ghost or is also a synonym for the Spirit of the Lord or the Spirit coming upon the Lord Jesus Christ, falling upon the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Was this salvation for Jesus? No, it's not salvation for Jesus. What is it? Does he already have the Spirit of the Lord? Does Jesus already have the Holy Spirit? <laughs> it, it, that is an important question. Of course he does. <laughs> does Jesus need to be born again? <laughs> no, okay? And he's God incarnate in the flesh, okay? But he's now being in, he's now being baptized for what? He's about 30 years of age. What has he been baptized for? He's being empowered, okay? He's, being, he's receiving the spirit without measure, to speak the word without measure, as we just recently read there in John chapter 3, okay? Well, I know I'm getting off on a little bit of tangent. I just want you to collect all of this information. It's just, as you do, it's so enriching. It's so rewarding. You can't learn everything overnight. You can't eat an elephant, so to speak, all at once. Just one bite at a time, you know. And that's a, probably a very wrong allegory to use. But nonetheless, there's a lot of information here. Be patient with yourself. Okay, Matthew 20, 20. 
Um, forgive me, Matthew 20, verse 22, Jesus answered and said to them, you know, he says, are you able, he, you know, they want they to sit on his right hand, left hand. He said, are you able to drink the cup that I drink of? And are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said, we are. Okay, so now um, Jesus says, okay, you will be able to drink the cup that, I'm, that I drink. And the baptism with, that I'm baptized with, you shall also be baptized with. Okay. What baptism is he talking about now? Jesus is saying, can you be baptized with a baptism that I am baptized with? Well, what were the baptisms that Jesus had? Well, up to this point, we only have two baptisms that Jesus had. He has the baptism that he received um, when he was baptized in water, and we have the baptism that he received when he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. Okay. <laughs> And I'll tell you right now, this is where people like F.F. Bosworth started saying baptism in the Holy Ghost doesn't have an initial evidence of the language of the Spirit. But I'm going to tell you right now, that's a misapplication. And you need to prove why that is a misapplication. You do. Okay. Um, and so, uh, yeah, moving right along here, just little, I just want to seed you with different little things as we go along here, helping you to understand how to be sensitive to category, categorize things. That's why I'm taking the time here to walk through these um, various different words. It's, I know, a little bit challenging, and I know it's a little bit, you know, arduous, takes time, but look, this is the way it's got to be done. Verse 20, uh, Matthew 21, 25 now is your next one in your line. We're, once again, we're looking at on the search engine, uh, just putting in B A B A B A P T I Z Ascaris. The Ascaris is all about being able to capture all of the different baptize, baptizing, baptize, baptism, etc. Okay. Yeah, it gets baptism right. Okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we've got uh, 297 results and 245 verses. Are we going to be able to get through all of them? No, we're not. But I hope, hopefully, by the time I do, you know, uh, call it uh, on baptism so I can look at a, a couple of phrases with you, you really will have the flow of this, okay? Um, then Matthew 21, 25, the baptism of John. From where was it? Was it from heaven or of men? Jesus just asking, you know, the question, you know, did, bapt did John receive authority from God to baptize the people that came to him? Did God give him that? Was it from heaven? Yes, it was, obviously. What were the results? Question is still in. Okay, Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, it's our assignment. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Clearly, once again, now that's the category of the baptism that a minister of the gospel then is supposed to perform as Philip did and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in water, okay? And you know what's going to happen then? He's going to, people are going to start talking about, oh, you're supposed to sprinkle or you're supposed to dip or you're supposed to total immersion. <laughs> there shouldn't even be a question after you get finished looking at how First of all, the word baptism, that's a great place to say, you know, to, to, to begin to look at definitions of words. Uh, the first time the word was used, it was used by one of the ancient Greek physicians, uh, Nicander, I believe it was. And he said, well, he described it in a formula for uh, making pickles, okay? So <laughs> the last step basically was take the cucumber and, and uh, baptize it in vinegar. <laughs> Well, that's not sprinkling it, okay? So, you know, and there's a lot of more, de there's a lot other uh, other ways to get at those definitions. There's a lot of information there. But using that as an example of why it's so important to go ahead and, you know, when you, when you take key words in a verse of scripture that you want to understand more perfectly, it is, at, it is really essential. It is very, very needful that you, if you want to get the biggest, you know, impact here in your study to run down all of, the, as many of the definitions as you can find out there. I'm going to give you some examples of that, as I said later, I promise, so I've got to do it. Okay, so moving on to Mark. And of course, when you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
there are a number of uh, verses of scripture, a uh, number of stories, a number of events and things that are common to all four. So, you know, you can, you can understand that and, and then, and then, you know, utilize that information accordingly. Okay. Mark 1, 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Here we go. Maybe that's one of the answers to our questions. Okay. So he's, he, there, he's saying, look, you come get baptized in water and your sins are going to be remitted. Done away, blotted out, you know, erased. Because now if you look up the word for remission, okay, that's a good thing to do. You just, you know, once again, as you're going along and you're getting this types of information, it's good to just, you know, point and click, especially when you've got good search engines. All you got to do is point on uh, remission, okay? And then you'll see the word Ophesis, the Greek word Ophesis, uh, from and so you don't have to be able to pronounce that word. You don't necessarily even have to recognize that word because then once again you point and click on the Greek word, and there you have it. You've got all these various different um, dictionaries, uh, Strong's Greek uh, Dictionary, and I probably have I don't know I have many. <laughs> I have more than twenty, probably more than forty dictionaries different dictionaries for words. And um, this is the way you derive your understanding of the word. This is how you become a disciple of the word of God. And the singular word, as well as the words, <laughs> and the message, okay? And, or you just continue on being spoon-fed whatever it is your favorite preacher is, and you're just simply a disciple of your favorite preacher. And so when somebody asks you, who are you a follower of, just tell them the preacher's name. And of course, I say that to provoke you because you want to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and you want to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's, let's do so. And um, yeah, we have reverence and respect for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers and the special giftings that God has given there and the special abilities that Father has graced them with. But everything has to be proven by the word of God. So let's prove it, okay? That's what we're doing. And I say that with all due respect, hopefully everybody uh, got that. Okay, and there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. There we can, once again, uh, here's the Mark 1, 8. I indeed baptize you with water, but he that baptizes, uh, but he, speaking of the Messiah that's going to come, Christ Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And that phrase, once again, is going to be used in every single one of the gospels, all four gospels. Are going to talk about that. Okay, I've got to call it on that. There's so much more to deal with. There's so much more information to glean from this. Um, you start gleaning it. You start putting your categories together. Maybe I could run down and and just well, if I don't if I don't stop and go to the next phrase, um, we're just simply you know not going to get to it. Okay, so. Um, one of the last phrases that I wanted to get at was believe it on the name of the Lord Jesus and uh, and baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus, okay? So if you look at Acts 8.12, you can see why. Because but when they, it says, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and, uh, and women, okay? Um, so... Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with the Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which Philip did. And I just want to point out, Simon also, and this is a unique little caveat here, Simon did what everybody else did, but he really got sorted out when it came to this ministry of the Holy Ghost falling upon him, okay? <laughs> he got sorted out. So, uh, it was it, it was very important for me to look at two phrases then. Um, first of all, as we said in verse 16, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So it was important to, for, to, to me for us to look at believing in the name of Jesus, okay, calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus, okay, and then being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so if we really, if we want to kind of just, quickly 
begin to pick up those phrases, okay, and, and understand what it means and and perhaps what it doesn't mean, um, what it includes, and possibly what it excludes. Then what we should do in our search engine is we ought to go after a phrase, okay, um, to kind of collect all of the information on this and and we may not start necessarily with the best phrase but it will at least lead us to a place where potentially we will flesh out even a better phrase and so what I'm going to say is let's put in the phrase um, the name of the Lord okay we might want to use the name of the Lord Jesus or in the name of Jesus um, but let's just start with this phrase. And for most search engines, what you would do is you would use a parentheses, okay? So that it really focuses on the phrase and not just going out there and searching what verses of scripture contains these number of words, like believe in the, the name of Jesus, with six words. So some search engines would just go out there in any place that the search engine found those six words occurring in a single verse, then it would bring that up. And it may not be the phrase, but if we put in a parentheses um, and then type in, um, in the name of Jesus, okay? And then search on that. Let's see what happens. All of a sudden, you're going to get, I'm getting um, probably right around 22 results. Um, then, you know, some of the highlighted verses of scripture that I'm seeing just to start off with is, for example, Acts 4.18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. And then Acts 2.38, Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, okay? Um, that formula, we've already talked a little bit about that, okay? We've seen, like, for example, there's a great, a great verse of scripture to break out, Acts 2.38, okay? We've seen in Samaria, we saw them believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw them baptized, um, and then they were still waiting. The gift of the Holy Ghost was not yet given to them, okay? That because the Holy Ghost had not yet fallen upon them. And I, of course, you know that's to be true because when you began to analyze Acts 10, you saw that the baptism of the Holy Ghost or when the Holy Ghost fell upon them or to be filled with the Holy Ghost, we, we took all of those words and we strung them together and showed their equivalence from looking at Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, and then looking at the fact that in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, Peter is saying, look, this is the same thing that happened to us on the day of Pentecost, okay? So we see that in Samaria, however, we they, were, they had been believed on the name of the Lord Jesus. They had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, they had not yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost in, in the sense that the Holy Ghost had not fallen on them. Once again, our question that's outstanding that we're gathering information for, had they, re, had they received the Holy Spirit, when they were born again, did they receive the Spirit of the Lord when they were born again? And by this time, you know that they have. And hopefully in this search, we begin to then solidify some of the conclusions that we derived from the first search we did in, in, with the Holy Spirit and the result of the Holy Spirit, you know, and, 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 or Spirit, Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of God. And then another thing that I will suggest to you to do a little bit more advanced is where all of a sudden you take significant words, very important words in a sentence or very important words in the question like spirit and salvation or spirit and saved or spirit and baptism, things like that. And you put them in the same search. So I got spirit and salvation or spirit and saved and search those words, those com combination of words. Um, Sometimes you get a lot of information there. Sometimes you don't get a lot because it's not that those two words aren't associated. It's just that they. It's sometimes the, the word search doesn't make it that simple, okay? And hopefully 
You understand what I'm saying without explaining that more. <laughs> Spend more time doing it <laughs> and you'll get it. Um, and in Acts 10, 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Okay, so he just leaves it. And of course, we know in Acts 10, 48, what's being talked about here when he says in the name of the Lord. So well, some of the questions we're asking here is when you, um, when you baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus, are you excluding the Father? Are you excluding the Holy Ghost? Are you in any way excluding the baptism formula that Jesus gave that we've already began to look at? To baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, um, you know, uh, let me just stop for just a second because this is really good to do. Type in your search engine, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay. How many verses of scripture you get? One. One. So then you, you begin to ask yourself this question. Um, well, you only have one verse of scripture on this. It, are there two? Are there are there those verses of scripture that imply it. Um, for example, 1 John 5, 7 says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, which is at once, a, is this, the Word is a synonym for the Son. The Word is a synonym for the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Word is a synonym, synonym, in this case, for the Lord and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Okay, so yeah, there is there is another verse of scripture that, that implies it. Furthermore, Jesus was never doing anything that he was doing unless he heard the Father uh, say it or, or, or saw the Father do it. And all the works that were going on in his life, they were done by the Father, okay? <laughs> so there is a connectivity. Clearly, the scripture shows a distinction, but there's also absolutely a connectivity in the witness and in the ministry of the gospel by the Lord Jesus Christ and 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 the Father and the Holy Ghost that this is all they're being done this is all being done in unison by them uh, you know for example John 4 26 Jesus says but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name <laughs> I mean there you have all three again okay so there it is implied again so yes this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit more subtle. It's a very important lesson with respect to drawing out um, those two and three witnesses sometimes that have a little bit more, um, uh, it's a little bit more obscure. It's a little bit more difficult than just typing in the three words, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, we could go on. There's, there's more that um, is, to, is to be said about this. And so uh, another thing that you might want to do, uh, that I encourage you to do, is to look at all, if you would, four Great Commission formulas, if you would. Okay. Somebody said, well, what do you mean? Okay. For example... Go to Mark chapter uh, 16 and verse 17. It's the Great Commission, okay, in the sense that it's the last charge of the Lord Jesus Christ to the disciples of what they're now supposed to go do, just like you read in Matthew chapter um, 28. Um, and, 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 and it reads like this, beginning in verse 15. So in Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not and shall, shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, uh, uh, it, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay the hands on the sick and they shall recover. Okay, so you have to ask yourself then, are there any contradictions within the framework of 
the great commissions of, that are that are given in the four gospels. And of course, the answer to that question is absolutely not. It just in this particular instance, the Lord says, go baptize them. He didn't specifically say to go baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he certainly didn't say, don't baptize them in the name of the Father and the Holy Ghost. And he certainly did not say, only baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. Or to, he didn't simply say, he didn't say, go and baptize him in the name of the Lord Jesus. He didn't say that. You can't make him say that. There is no exclusion of the other that was said, what was said in Matthew chapter 12, or what's said in Luke, okay, or what's said in John. So they're inclusive. They are inclusive. They're one continuous story. Um, if you, there, there are a number of different uh, harmonizations of the gospel. I really like mine. <laughs> I'm a little biased, but I did a, a sequential events in the life of Jesus, a chronological description. And so there I take, and I show you, there's no contradictions in the gospels. I show you that they are these, that these types of, of things are to be inclusive. They're inclusive. They're, there's no contradiction. There's inclusive. They're inclusive. If you think, you know, that Everything that God has ever done is written in the Bible. Certainly, you would not think that. And, and, and it's, as John said, if all that Jesus said and did, if if everything was that was important, everything that was good, and all that He did, and all that was you know ministered uh, was written, He supposed that the whole world couldn't contain the book. So the Lord gives us highlights. So we know we're not getting contradictions, and though things can be very very similar. There's still unique events, and there's ways to, to, to prove that and to set a chronology. Chronology is the backbone of history. If we can set a chronology, then we can build around that backbone and begin to see the structure of Scripture. So, okay, enough said there. Let me see what I, see if I got just a little bit more time just to talk a little bit more about, um, about uh, the name. Okay, get back over to the name. Okay. Where was it? Uh, I think I lost it. Okay. In, in the name. Okay. So we're, we're doing a parentheses and I'm doing in the name of Jesus. Okay. Okay. So Acts 2.38, we went over that one. Acts 3.6, uh, Acts 3.6. Uh, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give you, give, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Uh, healing in the name. Okay, so we've got baptism in the name. And so when we look at baptism in the name, once again, we're looking at, at, at doing something in the name of Jesus Christ, which is the authority of salvation. It's his name by his name. There's no name given under heaven whereby men may be saved. We understand that Father has bested all power and authority in that name and that what's it will ultimately discover that whatsoever you do in word and deed do all in the name of jesus so um what's so important for us to do here is to two things we want to we want to begin to recognize that once again it's the authority of the name of jesus by which someone is saved and to what degree or extent um or limits should we place upon baptism and and with respect to uh, a baptismal formula with or without the name of Jesus. And my conclusion to that is simply that we should baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. And somebody says, well, that's redundant because you said you baptize in the name of the Son. No, it's not redundant. I'm just being, I'm being specific and all inclusive. I'm including everything that the scripture has to say. So then, you know, reality of it is, I'm going to tell you right now, those people who basically belong to the group that, um, you know, let's just say, let's just say PC Nelson and, and how PC Nelson organized things with respect to uh, the Assemblies of God and those things that Bartleman said, which ultimately became more or less the Apostolic Church uh, and, uh, you know, the church uh, that... Um, basically is what we refer to as, as Jesus only, though there's more doctrines there associated with that. Um, at least certainly when it comes to the baptism formula, uh, uh, someone who is um, a Pentecostal Jesus only 
uh, should not have any problems <laughs> anymore with somebody who's baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to leave out baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, because Jesus said it, and there are too many verses of Scripture in an overall picture of things that very conclusively say uh, that the whole of salvation involves the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Who is ever going to argue with that? And that should never be an argument. Um, I hope, hopefully that's easy for you to understand. You know, once again, if you have questions about things that I'm saying, you can email me um, and I, I'll actually put it uh, when I post it up on, on the Facebook this time. You can get my email and you can email me any questions by going to www.abidingplace.org. That's our church website. Email the pastor, okay? <laughs> and I'm happy to walk through any questions that you have. I don't look at somebody asking questions as being disrespectful or derogatory. The Lord told me to be ready to give every man a reason for this confidence or expectation or hope, however you want to look at it. I just look at elsis, the Greek word, as more than just hope. Hope might have been expectation and confidence for people in the 15th, 16th century, but it means something different to us today at this time. Another good point for the proper, you know, uh, uh, study of definitions. Listen, that's all for today. Sorry, I couldn't do more. We're going to be we're going to be looking at conclusions next lecture, lecture ten, making sure that all of our rules have been applied. The Lord bless you, keep you in Jesus' name.